Okay, um, welcome everyone. Thanks for thanks for being here today. Uh, I am Geth Davis, Key Account Specialist at Cloud Essentials, and it's uh, my first experience at top and tail in our webinars today. So uh, I've got the easy job of just introducing it all. Thankfully, I've got our usual star team to help us guide us through this session. So we've got Johan van Schalkwijk, our Managing Director over in South Africa and Head of Solutions. We've got our fantastic compliance lead, Nivash Sanilal, and we've got the brilliant Roche Veenman, Modern Work and Content Management Lead at Cloud Essentials. So you've probably got an idea as to what today is all about uh, from reading the info that we did, that we sent out in terms of signing up. But just to summarize it a little bit for us, it's around sort of helping, advising and guiding you through some strategies really to prevent spiraling Microsoft data storage uh, fees. So taking control of your content management, uh, hopefully ways of reducing costs and minimizing risks, including then strategic use of backup and archiving. And I think what you'll sort of take away from today is, is an idea of what to do next, whatever your current situation is. Um, we're going to break the session down into four main parts, which the team are going to cover. So calculating monthly storage requirements, looking at the pitfalls to avoid when it comes to version control, uh, look at backup versus archiving versus third party applications. Um, and we'll give you our sort of recommendations here as well. And then also some tips to engage in terms of, you know, key business stakeholders to drive decision making in this area as well. And then depending on how the team get on, we should also have time for a Q&A at the end. So please post any questions you've got along the way in the chat and we'll do our best to get those that uh, covered at some point during the process as well. The format is gonna be uh, mics are off throughout the content. Uh, we've got some audience participation sections. So we will ask you to get involved in a, in a live Slido question uh, a couple of times as we go through. So get your phones ready for that as well. Before we jump into it, though, um, some of you here today are probably new to Cloud Essentials. Uh, apologies for the ones that are not, but it's always good to just remind everyone, you know, where we sit and where our expertise lie. So Cloud Essentials are a long-standing and dedicated Microsoft 365 partner, so gold status partner, and we specialize in the area of content management. So we help organizations mature their approach to things like reducing the risk profile of your content in M365, migrating and managing the content cost effectively and ultimately opening up the value in content so you can surface it to your business advantage really um, which is becoming more and more important when we're talking about you know the advances in ai and business processes now as well um, unique to our business is our in-house compliance team which is led by legal and risk professionals and that's represented by navasha today um, but i guess overall we help our clients create conditions for regulatory and, and risk requirements to flow down into the Microsoft Cloud environment. So you should find our session today will bring sort of lessons learned from that perspective as well. So real world stories which are great to relate to really. OK, so let's get going. Um, I'm firstly going to pass you over to Johan. Um, what he doesn't know about Microsoft solutions isn't worth knowing, and he's going to talk about sort of spiraling data volumes. But I think he's going to start off with a Slido question, actually, to get you sort of involved from the start. So, Johan, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Keith. And um, so as a starting point, um, we just want to understand from our participants today, <clears throat> how close are you to reaching your SharePoint data storage limits? So if you can please join um, the slider that you can see on screen, either with the QR code or just at slider.com with the number you can see on screen and just to indicate um, where you are with your data storage limits. <clears throat> Cool. So we, we've got one vote so far um, and they're starting to worry. Yeah, I think a lot of organizations today are actually seeing that they are running out of their storage if they have not already um, breached their storage um, and have to um, buy additional storage volumes from Microsoft natively or even look at third party solutions to alleviate the cost of the native SharePoint storage. So I think that's a good segue into the first section, just understanding why we are seeing these problems. Why are we seeing these spiraling data volumes across most Microsoft 365 tenants? 
Um, and also just to mention or highlight some of the recent changes that Microsoft have implemented to allow you to manage these aspiring data volumes. But firstly, it is important to understand two key factors for um, contributing to these aspiring data volumes. The first one is SharePoint um, and OneDrive versions. Um, so there are three main areas where you can control your version limits um, from your SharePoint or OneDrive for, for business configuration. Um, the first one is at the organization or tenant level. By default, Microsoft set this limit to 500 major versions. And Rache, later on in today's webinar, will cover some of the more technical details, but this is just some high-level information that's important to understand. Recently, Microsoft have released the ability for you to break that inherent a version limit setting and apply different version controls at the site level and at the library level. What that means, as you can see on screen, the example is if you configure the legal site not to inherit the organization version limit, you can specify a different version limit at that site level. So for example, the legal site will only allow two versions of a file um, and that's the version limit. And that limit will filter down to the library level and even at the file level for, for any content under the legal site. You also have the ability to break that inheritance and change that version setting on a library level at the document library level. Whereas you can see the sales site for this tenant, they've got two separate libraries, document libraries under that site where one will have its own unique version limit setting um, and the other one will inherit the default organization version limit. So that setting is a new setting that organizations can utilize to better manage their versions that actually you'll see later in today's webinar actually consume a lot of data storage within your SharePoint and OneDrive um, for business environments. But a big factor that also contributes to your high SharePoint and OneDrive for business and uh, OneDrive for business usage is retention policies. Um, if you are not familiar with how retention, that essentially is applying a hold onto all content um, with, if it's a retention policy or on a document if it's a retention label. What that essentially means is that if a document has got a retention or hold applied, if a user edits or make changes to the document, that version um, and the document is copied to what is known as the preservation hold library. It will remain in that preservation hold library and contribute to the SharePoint site usage for the period of that retention policy. So if you have a retention policy defined to retain all SharePoint documents for 10 years, that preservation old library and all versions of that file will stay in the preservation old library for 10 years um, and really make that, that document library massive and um, before it actually can be deleted after the retention period has lapsed. To understand why retention contributes to the consumption of your SharePoint volume is it's based on the principles of retention. So when Microsoft released their governance framework and methodology, they applied the following four principles of retention. And what's important that you can see on screen is that retention always wins over deletion. So if you've got multiple retention policies or even a combination of retention labels and retention policies applying to a file, if you've got a delete action, um, and a re re retain action, the retention will always win, regardless of any of the other uh, um, policies and retention configurations you have in place. To understand the principles of retention, Microsoft have published a workflow that we always advise our clients and we use when we do the purview and retention um, deployment with them to use this framework and flow diagram to understand when content will be retained and when content will be deleted. So we can share this link with everybody after today's webinar.
to simply explain how versions and retention policies work, um, I've created the simulation that you can see on screen today. Here you can see we've got a document library with a five-year retention policy that applies to that document library. But also configured is a, a default version limit um, and for the organization and actually a site version limit that applies to this document library um, specifically. But what happens if you've got a retention policy in place? Essentially, that retention policy overrides all version limits within this document library. So what that means is every time a user opens up and modifies this file, a new version of this file is created in the preservation world library. And it will continue to grow past even the organization limit and really consume high volumes of data within your SharePoint and OneDrive for business um, storage um, allocations. So that's how retention policies work. But as I mentioned, you can also apply retention label. So in, instead of it implicitly applying to a location such as SharePoint or a team site or OneDrive for business location, retention label, you can either manually or automatically apply at a file level. If you apply a retention that you can see, for the example, on screen to a file, that actually honors the version limits that's configured and applies to the document library. So what that actually means is, as users edit and modify these files, new versions are created until it reaches the site version or the version limit set on this location. If a user then modifies the file again, it will delete the oldest file from the preservation or library. So honoring the version limit. So retention labels offers more integration with version control than retention policies. And it's always re the recommended approach for specific file types, especially your big ones that Roche will cover off later. Just important to note, um, it's always um, when files are deleted, the questions is always ask, um, can users or admins recover these files? Um, and in this instance, when this automated version trimming occurs, those files are permanently deleted um, after the recycle bin process. That can take up to 93 days, but then it is not recoverable um, and not restorable, not even by your administrators on your tenant. So before I go and hand over to Roche, um, just another slide um, and a poll that you can please participate um, and indicate how familiar you are with your retention policies and retention labels within Microsoft 365. And here the options are very familiar. We have set them up and they are running um, or somewhat familiar. You've played around, but you haven't really deployed it. Or oh, if you have not heard about retention policy and retention labels within Microsoft at all. So if you can please join and fight for your answer. Cool. Yeah, I think a lot of the Microsoft purview technologies and solutions like data lifecycle management or even information protection, um, it's relatively new. And, and while we're still on the, the up curve of deploying these cloud-based native data security solutions, I think as you can see on screen, most organizations are actually somewhat familiar. They've played around it. Um, they've they probably have got other legacy controls in place, um, uh, but not really have deployed the Microsoft retention and data loss cycle management solution yet. So yeah, I think that's it for me. Um, I'll hand over now to Roche to cover off some of the reporting and how you can address these data storage costs within SharePoint. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for the hand up. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to look in these uh, slides that I've prepared on how important it is actually for you to consider versioning. We're going to chat a bit about what versioning is and how that affects your storage at the back end. But to start off, um, we're going to look at how are we going to check our storage within our environment. So 
not a lot to talk about on the slide because I want to jump straight into a demo because I want to show you live how you can actually access these um, files using your SharePoint environment. Some of you might already be avail oh, familiar with how to access the content, but for those of you who don't know, I'll quickly run you through that process. So I'm going to hijack the screen for a second. Okay, so there are a couple of native reports that are available that you can access from your SharePoint admin portal. If you don't know how to get to the SharePoint admin portal, you'll just go to your admin.microsoft.com and from there underneath your admin center, if you've got the correct permission set up, you click on SharePoint. That will immediately launch your uh, SharePoint admin center. And then from here, we're going to go into our active sites. So the three first reports that I'm going to talk about are just high level reports, and that's going to give you some form of indication of where you currently are and how far away you are from reaching your storage quota. So the first and main option is on the left hand side of your screen over here while you're in your active sites, you can see that this is the amount of storage that we currently have used in this demo environment of a 1.5 terabyte. So I can see that I am well underneath my quota. For those of you who are a bit past your quota, you're going to start getting a red line over here and you're going to have a pop up to start consider uh, purchasing additional SharePoint storage for your environment. So that's the first report. The second report is your SharePoint sites view. From here, you'll get a summary of what sites are available. You can see the amount of storage that has been used per site. All of these um, columns at the top over here are interactive, so you can click on the drop down and then sort them based on larger to smaller to give you a indication of which of your sites are currently culprits that's eating up all of your storage in your tenant. And then there are also filters on the side over here that you can apply to the view to shorten your list by specific um, filters. So you can see, you can also just click on the largest sites over here, and then that's only going to give you the largest sites within your tenant. So there are a couple of filters here that you can also use to apply. The third option you can do is if you want to go and play around with Excel at the back end, you are able to export all of this information in the site uh, by clicking on the export button over here. What that will then do is it's going to export a CSV file of all of the sites in your environment. And then if you open it, you'll see that it's got all of the same information within that Excel file that is on this view over here. Oops. Oh, Excel is not my friend today. There we go. So all of the information that you've got on the screen over there is in the CSV file. So you can then use the information in here to set up a graph or a pie chart to see what your consumption is in your environment. The third way to do it is to access the storage metrics from a specific site. So I see that this site is a problem for me at the moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on the site. From here, I'm going to open the site by clicking on site address. And then this is a bit more of an in-depth report. So you'll use this if you want to look at the content from a site level. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on the gear on the top right hand corner. From here, we're going to click on site information and then click on view all site settings. You'll see there's a couple of options available here, but the one that we want to focus on is under your site collection administration options. And then there is a report over here called storage metrics. So we're going to click on that. So here you'll immediately see all of the storage that's being used up by your site. And like Johan explained earlier, if you've got preservation hold uh, retention policy set up in your environment, 
all of that content is going to go live within your preservation hold library. So that storage essentially isn't freed up until that expiry date has been met. So this can also be one of the culprits causing you to reach your storage quota. Okay, but we want to go into a bit more of an in-depth look at our content. And I see that documents is currently my biggest document library in the site. So if I click on documents, it's going to open the document library for me. And here I can now see the content and folders within the document library. So again, I can see that the stuff on this level is not consuming a lot of um, storage but my 3D vendors is consuming a lot of storage. So you can trinkle down into these folders deeply to try and figure out what items or what file types, which I'm going to discuss with you later, are also causing these problems or storage, uh, consuming too much of your storage. <clears throat> Okay, so there are also advanced reports. So I'm going to stop sharing on my side. You know, if you can just share again. So those are the native options available. So the next options we're going to be looking at are a bit more of advanced options. So if you want something that gives you a more detailed um, report of the content within your site. There are PowerShell scripts that you can use to extract that information. Um, and then you can also extract that within a CSV format and leverage that data and use Power BI to translate the data into dashboards. If you cannot do Power BI reports yourself, we can assist you with this types of um, advanced reporting. Okay, so now we're going to look at the importance of wireframing, specifically for version control. The reason for that is if your version control is not set up correctly, it's going to consume a lot of the storage that um, you have in your environment. So, Let's quickly have a look at that. Okay, so from a versioning perspective, uh, this is what versioning is going to look like at the back end within your environment. Uh, the image on the left hand side will show you uh, both scenarios. You'll see that the major versions are the options that are three, four, five, and then we've got one minor version submission in there, which is the 8.1. So first we need to understand why version history is available and it is purely to facilitate your co-authoring at the back end. So imagine 10 people working on the same document and all of them are doing their specific edits. You would need to keep track of all of those changes in order for you to have a maintained history of everything that has been done on that document. This also allows users to then go to this view that I've got on the left hand side over here to view previous versions so that if someone went and deleted something they were not supposed to delete, they can then use this view to restore to a previous version. So you'll see on option number nine over there, someone restored from a version six. So what that then does, it creates a new version on top of the latest version uh, and that will then be your version six document. Um, versioning is split between two types. You've got major versions. And like I said earlier, major versions is tracked by just submitting a one point number or a two point number. And this is what is enabled by default on all SharePoint libraries when you create a site. So you need to know that these settings need to be amended when creating a site. Otherwise, you're going to sit with the default settings, which is going to consume a lot of your storage. Minor versions is more of a drafting way of working. And what that does is, as you are working on the edits of a document, it will create a 0.1 version of a document. And only when you are comfortable that you are so you've set up the content correctly within that document. You go and publish that document as a major version into the environment. 
So again, this is very useful for documents under review or collaboration, and it's only published when you have approved it. A couple of things we also need to keep in mind with the retention. So administrators, like I said earlier, need to configure the amount of storage. Uh, you can maintain this by looking at the file types, which I'll talk to you about in the next slide. And then also just a side note, um, again, a default setting. If you create a SharePoint document library, by default, you will have 500 major versions. So we're going to see how that eats up uh, your storage very quickly if that is not customized in your settings. So what I've done over here is we're all familiar with clothing sizes. So in my lifetime, I've bought small, medium and large clothes. I think I'm in my large phase. It was a very long winter at this stage. But yeah, just to give you a familiar way of tracking those file sizes, um, I've set up this visual over here. So small files are your basic Word text document, basic spreadsheets, compressed images, and email files. These are lightweight files. They're easy to transfer and uh, store within your environment. And the typical size ranges for those files are between one kilobyte and 500 kilobytes. So, Let's look at the storage consumption. So if we look at the worst case scenario for a small file, if we've got 500 versions of a 500 kilobyte file, we're looking at 245 megabytes just for one file. If we look at medium files, these are typically your presentations, audio files, high resolution images, large spreadsheets that finance departments would use to set up and reference other sheets to get calculations set up, and other large text documents like proposals or agreements uh, that is normally what businesses circulate. Um, this is high rich media content, so it's formatted documents with images and visuals inside of them, which will also consume a lot of storage if not handled correctly. So typical size ranges for those are between 500 kilobytes and 100 megabytes. And now we're starting to see how this is going to impact even a small tenant. Um, because 100 megabyte files, if we've got 500 versions of that, we're looking at 48 gigabytes per one for one specific file. And then this is where it gets super scary is if we start looking at large files, and those are typically your, your, typically your AutoCAD files, project files, videos, database files, installers, and software. And these are files that demand a lot of storage at the back end. It uses a lot of computing resources. So you can understand that it is quite a large file. The typical file range for these types of files is between 100 megabytes and 10 gigabytes. And we've actually had a client that had this problem where they used AutoCAD within their environment. They very, very quickly ran out of storage. And let's look at what that storage consumption is going to look like. So if we've got a 10 gigabyte file and we've created 500 versions of that file, you are looking at a 4.8 terabyte storage consumption within your environment. And I mean, even for a large um, environment that has a lot of licenses to cater for this, this is a lot for just one specific file. So this, this is what I mean when I say you need to plan based on file type. So for finance files, you might only keep 10 versions of a file, depending on the type of edits that you make to that specific file. For small um, text documents, that's also a, low, a larger number. But um, these are the types of questions that we need to be asking ourselves today before we are creating sites. So you need to set reasonable limits based on the file types that you've got within your environment. You have to define correct disposition policies to remove irrelevant versions. Otherwise, you're just going to sit with that deleted version within your preservation old library, and then you're going to get you're never going to get rid of that content. And then you have to regularly monitor your storage metrics to ensure that it does not go 
grown out of control. OK, so the next part of my slides, I'm just going to quickly take you through backup versus archiving and um, in which scenario you would use each of them. <clears throat> so there is no specific scenario that I can tell you is going to cater for either of those options. It is something that you would have to map out with an expert to chat with them will define that scenario or your business requirement and then based off of that we could then advise you what would be the best solution for you to use but just to give you an idea of what the differences are between the two um, we've got this table on the screen over here so the purpose for your backup solution is for quick recovery after loss or failure and that just means that if somebody went and maliciously deleted any content or you've had a um, ransomware, you have a quick recovery option to get that content back. So the retention for a backup is short to medium term. But like I said, you can't say it to a specific scenario because we've got a client that actually uses their backup solution as a archiving solution as well. So as the data is removed out of their environment, they rely heavily on the backups to get that content back if they need it. So access to backup content is frequent or emergency access. Like I said, if a ransomware is kicked off within your environment, you're going to have to roll back to a previous version of a document or get that backup um, from your environment. So examples for backups is just frequent backups of an environment to ensure that your data is protected from loss. So when do we use archive? So archive is something that you use for preservation of your inactive data. So let's use a scenario where you're working on a document, I've got a specific project, but we haven't worked on that content in the past six months. Do I really still need that information uh, available immediately or can I rely on a process that will bring that content back should I require it at a later stage. So that retention period is for a longer term. The access to it will be rare and occasional access because I don't need it now and this is for your historical records that need to be kept for legal purposes. Again going back to that scenario it might be someone that's returning I want files from a legal case that I've been working on, then you can go and archive that from a cheaper storage back into your um, SharePoint environment. So when do we use each? Again, for your backup, it's purely for your disaster recovery and deletions from a malicious person or to prefer, protect your frequently changing data. Uh, archive for compliance and historical um, records and to keep your inactive data in a more cost-effective solution. So what I've covered in my section was all of the technical bits that runs at the back end, but that's not all that needs to be done. You need to sit with someone that's going to assist you to define what policies have to be applied. And only after that has been done and the key stakeholders for this process has been identified, these policies can be implemented and then the technical bits can be applied to better suit those business requirements. And that's what Navasha is going to chat to you about. So over to you, Navasha. Thanks, Roche. So as we all know, data is one of the most valuable assets of any organization, but it also comes with significant responsibilities and risks. So at the risk of not turning or trying not to turn this into a governance uh, webinar, I'm going to stick to the topic at hand and rather talk to a little bit about how data retention, data deletion and record ma records management should indeed be part of your data governance strategy. Uh, and why I say this is, this is to 
ensure that there's proper handling, storage, and disposal of data in accordance with legal, regulatory, and business requirements. So as we've heard from Roche and Johan, our technology or the, te the technology we discussed with you can do amazing things, but to support that, you need people and process. So as we always say, a, a good control consists of people, process, and technology. So what I'm hoping to share with you is uh, either validate some of the concerns you're already having or some of the issues and challenges you might already have, um, or try and maybe just share some of my experiences with helping our clients um, through this data lifecycle uh, management journey. So as we always say at Cloud Essentials, it's not just a best practice, uh, it's become a necessity now. So not only due to data privacy and data protection regulations worldwide, but we're also seeing such a high cost of storage um, as Roche has, has, has taken us through as well. But now from a regulatory perspective, uh, we are seeing that organizations need to minimize the data they collect um, and store and rather not store and delete uh, unnecessary data. Um, this, this shift in mindset recognizes that data can be a double-edged sword, both uh, a valuable asset for your business, but also a potential liability. So having this data deletion or disposition program is a formal process for identifying, locating, and securely deleting data that is no longer needed or required by law or business processes or business purposes. So the challenges that we've encountered, um, as well as what we are aware of our clients facing with effective data disposition expand or, or comes from both the fact that there's always this expansion of regulatory agendas, whether you're looking at, you know, new AI legislation developing uh, or privacy legislation, which, which is also changing um, depending on, on, on the territory you're in. But there's also this proliferation of uh, data processing and storage, as well as this collection of historical sensitive data and data beyond um, retention periods. So so there's also we often see limited business integration and ownership and insufficient uh, data governance. So as Roche said earlier, um, the, the, the technology can do wonders. There's there's all these options available to you. But how, how does this contribute uh, to your overall data governance strategy and what have you put into place uh, for that? So with our clients, uh, we also notice a distinct jurisdictional difference in how they tackle uh, their data disposition and and deletion. So in more or highly litigious jurisdictions, we find that our clients choose a more aggressive deletion strategy um, only because this obviously impacts the volumes in which they may need to discover at a later stage, which obviously impacts um, costs and risks. So in order to tackle that, uh, what we advise our clients is it's key to take a risk-based approach in the creation of your data lifecycle management program uh, policies and processes. This means you need to identify and assess the potential risks associated with the different types of data, uh, but that obviously means understanding the different types of data you might have as an organization, and then starting to apply appropriate retention, deletion, and records management policies based on the level of risk that data carries. Uh, for example, data that contains personal or sensitive data um, or that is subject to legal or regulatory objection, uh, obligations may have a higher risk of causing harm or liability if it's not properly protected, retained, or disposed of. Therefore, such data may require stricter controls um, and longer or shorter retention periods than the rest of your data. Um, a risk-based approach can help your organization both balance the costs and benefits of uh, data governance and also avoid unnecessary or excessive data retention or deletion that could affect your operational efficiency, data quality, or your business value. So what I find is useful, some of the factors that you can use to uh, or some of the factors that really influence the level of risk of your data is actually understanding the nature and content of your data, uh, the purpose and use of that data, as well as the context and environment of the data. But 
I would say not most importantly, but also the consequences and impacts of such data. So as I said earlier, if it's personal information, is there a legal or regulatory obligation for how you retain that data and for how long you retain that data? If it's uh, proprietary information or maybe uh, not or not personal information, but but company uh, company sensitive information, could it possibly affect the company's reputation if it's not handled correctly? Um, so by assessing these factors, organizations now need to classify their data into different risk categories and apply different retention, deletion and records management policies accordingly. So in our experience, there's often a lack of clarity of the roles and responsibilities when it comes to the various stages of data lifecycle management. So often um, people in, in legal compliance could be tasked with the creation of a policy, um, but is that enough? So having the policy without the technology, um, but not having any integration into maybe the processes or the people that are working with the data. There has to be integration between data governance, so your data governance teams, your management teams uh, and processes, as well as transformation processes to effectively minimize risks and ensure compliance. So some of the steps that we advise and that we follow to achieve this integration within our clients uh, and is to follow a few strategic steps. So start with understanding your data and by defining your data and data structure. So by that I mean understand the types of data as well as the data elements and systems used in your organizational processes. Next, you want to understand your data usage. So work with your business. Um, and so when, when we say that, so try not to work in a silo. So work with your IT teams as well as your business and operational teams to leverage any tools that can tell you where uh, the data is and who is using it. To as well as to comprehend how data is created, stored, enhanced and shared as part of the various processes and data analytics. Um, next, you want to identify any data interdependencies. So identify links and cross references between data elements to understand data lineage and its impact on the business. Then you want to link data um, to legal holds and retention schedules. So this is typically um, you can consult with your legal, your compliance team, um, I'm sure. So either if they have an existing retention schedule or if you're working, if this is part of your process, um, they can assist you by consulting your regulatory universe to try and assess if there's any existing uh, regulatory obligations um, like your privacy uh, uh, legislation, which prescribes how long you can keep certain data. So you're in, in this process, you want to align data disposition strategy with your minimum retention periods based on your legal requirements. Um, and then lastly, but definitely not least, uh, you want to design approaches for de-identification and data disposal. So develop methods for de-identifying or disposing of data. Or uh, if, if you went back and if you listen to what Roche, is, uh, what Roche said, he shared the various methods and the various things you could do with the, with the technology. But you also need to meet with your business to understand what your retention and disposition uh, or disp uh, disposal requirements are for your data and what works best within your business strategy. And by following these strategic considerations, um, you could build uh, a holistic and disposition data disposition program that aligns with both your data privacy and data protection goals, but also with your business goals. To so it's also very important as part of the process to understand what your business needs, as I said, to understand the business goals. So to address the operational needs and the objectives uh, for document retention, it's essential to conduct a thorough assessment. So we often do this as part of our processes um, and the assessment should cover uh, some of the following key areas. So establish many, whether any um, data classification technology is currently in existence within your organization. So are you already using Microsoft Purview, for example? Uh, maybe not just for maybe not for this purpose, but could could you extend it to your data disposition uh, requirements? 
Then you'd need to obviously identify all your legal requirements applicable to your organization, including any industry specific regulations. Um, so if you're part of the energy or pharmaceuticals or financial services industry. So again, you could achieve this by consulting with your compliance team and consulting with your regulatory universe for your for your company. You'd also need to determine any contractual obligations or agreements with clients, partners, or vendors that may influence data retention periods. And I know conducting this assessment, if, if you're dealing with personal information, it tends to be a little easier and uh, no offense, but it tends to be a little easier. But if you're dealing with non-personal information, how do you decide what to keep so you know if, if there's no specific legislation saying i need to delete this so if there's no company legislation privacy legislation how do you actually um you know decide what to delete so the these steps that i'm sharing in the assessment is really to help you unpack that requirement so other than personal information so things like being able to determine any contractual obligations or agreements you might have with clients or partners or vendors that may also uh, affect your data retention period then you'd need to confirm the existence of a data management or governance strategy and again here it's not reinventing the wheel most companies have already devised um, a data governance framework or, or something similar to meet their privacy requirements so how can you now as part of your data lifecycle management uh, ensure that this governance framework is expanded to encompass uh, aspects like data access controls, data encryption, and data disposal methods within your data retention strategy. Um, and then lastly, verify the presence of any systems or technologies capable of efficiently managing and tracking data retention. So we, we've just unpacked uh, Microsoft's offering in this regard, uh, but, but just verifying any systems within your organization can also assist. So you're just trying to understand, is there anything within your organization that can already facilitate data, uh, data retrieval and secure disposal? Again, um, you know, it, could this possibly be a feature that that then your software um, that you might not know about? So all of these considerations are, are key um, in coming up with the strategy. And in our experience or in my experience, um, it is a little bit tougher when you're working with non-personal information to set a retention period. I think um, looking at the financial costs that that Roche has, uh, has laid out, um, as well as just if you think of things like AI adoption and how you know managing your data and ensuring you don't have stale data uh, ensures you get better usage out of future tools. So, so I think it's very important to do this assessment as well as come up or include data retention and disposal and deletion as part of your uh, overall data governance strategy. So um, I hope I've made some valid points, And but if you have any questions, please feel free to drop it in the chat or, or contact me directly. Thanks. Thanks, Nivasha, and thanks to Johan and Russia as well for those insights. Um, I think as an audience, you probably agree that was a, a pretty balanced approach, I suppose, to different scenarios. Uh, important to just sort of repeat, really, that our expertise really does come from, uh, you know, real world experiences. Um, and we got that from Nivasha's anecdotes with, with customers there at the end as well. Um, hopefully, a plenty of take homes for you as an audience to go away and think about what to do next. For me, some quick wins or, or some take homes from my side, straight from what the team have gone through there, you know, checking your burn rates. So find out what storage you have left and, and work out how long it will, uh, you know, how long it'll last. Don't get caught having, you know, to buy extra storage. Um, from an assessment perspective, our advice is always take a risk based approach, uh, analyze your data so you fully understand it and identify um, data owners and, and key stakeholders that need to be involved in this. And then finally, from me, I think we're talking about sort of the, the, the cloud essentials way. So I think super importantly, this is not a one time project. It's an ongoing program and that's where we come in. So we're an extension to your team, sort of bringing compliance and IT together, filling technology gaps and knowledge gaps. And that's the reason to talk to us on this after today, if you like. Um, 
I, I can see that Roche and Chris have been busy answering some questions over there in the chat. Um, I don't know if we've, I think we might have covered quite a few of them, but I don't know if you guys want to extend in on any of those comments that you've mentioned before we sort of wrap things up. Anything that you want to extend on those answers over there, Chris or Roche? Or if there are any other questions from the audience, then please post them now. I'll give it a yeah, few no, seconds. I have available. Is it? Oops, give me a second. Yeah, so if there's any specific questions on how to set up or the best way to use it, I mean, just let us know. I think I just saw a new message pop up there. Okay, so Tiki's asking, does OneDrive manage synchronization of large files from um, SharePoint, particularly for projects with frequent updates? And how does that ensure data consistency across multiple devices without risking version conflicts or data losses? Yes, so when you use OneDrive uh, or sync that library with your OneDrive, you would always see that um, OneDrive synchronization queue at the bottom of your screen. So as edits are implemented or added to a specific document or drawing or video file, the moment you click on save or if auto save is enabled on that file, it will immediately upload that file. But again, depending on your bandwidth size or your bandwidth um, of your internet, if it's a large file, like a five or a 10 gigabyte file, the upload of that file is still going to depend on your the bandwidth of your internet. Let's see, Kiki is typing another question. Let's just give her a couple of seconds. Uh, so for that specific scenario, unfortunately, because drawing applications aren't Microsoft applications, what would happen is if two people work on that same file and OneDrive tries to upload the file at the same time, it is going to pick up a conflict, uh, but it will notify you that it sees that there's a different version of the file and who has that version. So you can contact that person to find out what changes have been implemented and what that impact will be yeah. if it's either merged uh, because you can save it as a new version of a file, but um, you still have to communicate the changes to that file to see if it has to be re-implemented. Okay, that's great, Roche. Thanks for answering those. Um, I think we'll just close things off now, guys. Um, no problem, Kiki. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Um, there are some for just just for me to finish off. There are some further readings that we can point you towards, which are our blogs. So two specifically on some of the topics that we've discussed today. You can scan the QR codes that are on the screen, and I think Sally is um, at the same time putting them on the chat efficiently. Uh, so we've got why is everyone afraid to hit delete, which is a great blog. Um, and then we've got backup versus data retention and why you need both. So have a look at those for some extra reading. And then finally, from me, um, you know, if you have any further questions or want to discuss this any further, um, any of the topics that we've covered today or your you know, wider stance on sort of data governance and compliance, then feel free to book some time with me. The QR code is on the screen. I guess I'll probably do a, a little warning that I'm likely to get in touch and follow up on this as well. So we like to get feedback, engage interest levels in our topics for discussion. So look out for some contact from me as well. Um, and then finally, please do subscribe to our monthly newsletter as well. That will keep you up to date with everything you know that we're doing at Cloud Essentials. And apart from that, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for the fantastic team for their input. And we'll see you again next time.